Welcome to the Alabama Renaissance Fair. Public historian at Florence Lauderdale Public Library, local history genealogy department. Uh, my vacation started Friday we, for Renaissance Feast, which we did last night, and the Renaissance Fair, which hopefully everybody is aware that it goes on uh, this Saturday and Sunday from 10 to 6 Saturday and uh, 12 to 6 Sunday at Fountain on the Green, a.k.a. Woodrow Wilson Park. So come and revel and make merry with us. Nice to see so many roundtable people here from our feast last night. Uh, we had fun, but man, Lord Vivian is dog tired. But we, we had a great time. So this is the third in our annual uh, lectureship series sponsored by uh, the Florence, La uh, Florence Lauderdale Public Library, obviously the Alabama Renaissance Fair, and the University of North Alabama History Department. And, you know, to steal a line from Kermit the Frog in The Muppet Show when they did the open forum, this is how we kind of raise the intellectual level of the program and keep our fair grounded in actual intellectual history and not just complete fantasy. So we uh, really appreciate this partnership. The Renaissance, I'm also a board member of the Alabama Renaissance Fair and several of the board are here. So we appreciate this partnership with the library and especially UNA. We've had some great speakers. Uh, today's speaker, Dr. Lowe, is no stranger to us. A few of his students are here and others of us who know him. He uh, participates with the round table when his activities allow. He feasted with us last night with his kids who are also here. So kudos to you for being able to, to do that. Um, Dr. Lowe is equally at home talking about Monty Python, Doctor Who, uh, ancient Greco-Roman uh, excavations, or medieval Tudor burn marks and superstitions. He was born and raised in Shropshire in the UK, and you've been in the United States since 2018 or 19? 2018. 2018. And he's uh, on the faculty at the University of North Alabama in their history department. You've led one or two expeditions to Malta. Uh, three now. Three, oh, three yeah. expedition, archaeological expeditions to Malta. Uh, so he definitely knows his stuff. So without eating up any more of his time, I will turn the program over to Dr. Ben Lowe, who will talk about Tudor burn marks and superstitions. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you today. So I will try not to spill out. I feel like it's a sponsorship here. <laughs> <laughs> if I'd been smart, I would have got myself sponsored. So, Tudor burn marks and protective symbols. For fear oh, the eternal man. The quote comes from Robert Tooley, who was a 17th century doctor and conjurer from Widdicombe. Brilliant. Is that her? Brilliant. 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 Good. Do I need to shout? Put on my best professional. So, John Robert Tooley was a doctor and conjurer from Dartmouth, Dartmouth, uh, from Whittacombe in the Moor. And he convinced a patient of his who was suffering from neuroses that he was the victim of a the ghost of a neighbor who had committed suicide. The, we'll come back to the story, but uh, Tooley then charged his, I was about to say victim, patient, 20 shillings, which is an astronomical sum, so it should reassure you that uh, medical ethics haven't improved. But the story <laughs> is instructive because it shows that the supernatural was a perfectly plausible part of people's lives. That the devil and his agents are everywhere amongst us. Hugh Latimer, the Bishop of Worcester, told his congregation, I am not able to tell how many thousand be here amongst us now? In a country where perhaps two-thirds of the population were illiterate, images are particularly important as a means to protect against the supernatural. Depictions of St. Christopher that frequently decorate the halls of churches throughout England offer you Day's protection against illness or death. This one comes from Venice in Denbyshire and was painted between 1400 and 1430, and it shows uh, St. 
and Christopher Carey Baby Jesus on the back. My favourite is this one from Kempton, this is St Mary's Church. It was built in 1130 or so by the de Lacy family. Uh, Walter de Lacy had fought at Hastings and was the rich landowner in the area. He endows Gloucester Cathedral, for example, St Peter's Church in Heronhall. And on the north wall of the name, the clock name, we've got St Christopher, painted about 1370, the Wheel of Life, that's a 15th century painting, and the Wheel of Life is the vicissitude of mortality, that we will rise up and we will fall, and our fate is inevitable. So it's a reminder to the congregation of our mortality. And then in the window, you've got St. Anthony of Egypt, holding the book and the staff, and St. Michael, weighing the soul. Judgment. But since 2001, there's been a growing interest in protective symbols, and in particular, burn marks that occur in timber frame paintings. This is Tratara Court. It's a 14th to 15th century uh, fortified manor house down near Krakow in Paris in South Wales. They're commonly referred to as taper burn marks, and they create this very distinctive teardrop shape. In fact, they're so ubiquitous that they were long thought to just be the residue left by an unattended naked clan. And indeed, as I went round all these Tudor medieval houses, I looked at them and I thought exactly the same thing. But more recently, it's come out that they seem to be serving a deliberate purpose. There are several different explanations for them, that they are accidental, that it's an unattended naked flame causing these burn marks, that they were, you, that when you're making mauled beer, what you do is you take a red hot poker and you stick the poker in the pint of beer, but to test that the poker is ready, you would hold it against the wooden seat of the boat. Now the problem with that is they create a different shape. Some houses, like Sissinghurst Castle in Kent, Gainsborough Old Hall in Lincolnshire, Little Morton Hall in Cheshire, have literally hundreds of these. Not only are there far too many marks, there are also concentrations of marks. This is Tritara, the room we and you can see the cluster of burn marks in exactly the same place. They're also found in obscure corners, under the stairs, under floorboards, in the rafters, where light would have been unnecessary. There's also no evidence for them actually being associated We've got candles from the Mary Rose, Henry VIII's flagship, that sinks down by the Isle of Wight. And there, the candles are held in place by a picket, a nail in the base of the candle. Now, having a base is essential for safety, but there's no indication of a cricket with any of these burn marks. So, what are they? In 2014, in the Journal of Vernacular Architecture, John Dean and Nick Hill set out to recreate these marks. And they found that it took holding a burning taper, not a candle, at a 45 degree angle for 15 minutes to recreate this shape. The precision required to create this effect suggests that this is a now they range in date from the late 13th century to the middle of the 19th. The earliest examples from Donington Le Heath in Leicester have been dendrochronologically dated to the second half of the 13th century. Um, there are examples from Jericho Priory in Essex that have been dated to 1392. And whilst it's 
impossible to say whether the burn marks were applied to the timbers near or immediately after or whenever they were, the timbers were cut. At Donington Le Heath, Sissinghurst, or Gainsborough, the burn marks are cut by the warping of the wood when the wood is still fresh, i.e. the marks are being put on during construction or immediately thereafter, at least in some cases. Now rather than look at a lot of different properties, I thought we'd focus on my favourite few, and I'm going to show you this. Little Morton Hall in Cheshire, and I don't know whether the video will play for you. I will try to. <coughs> Sorry about that. We'll, we will just not, we won't let the video run. This isn't working now. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, probably going to happen. We'll just will. It's probably going to have to minimize it in the image, or it's not like that. It hasn't. It hasn't downloaded. So. Uh. No worries. Um, if we can just get through this slide. Leave it at that. Um, Little Morton Hall is special because it was <coughs> owned by the same family throughout its history. It was built by William Morton I in 1526, and his son then added the northwest wing and the porch 20 years later, and finally a carpenter by the name of Richard Deere added the gabled windows in the second story that you see there in 1559. Now the family came into hard times in the English Civil War. Uh, William Morton III, when he died in 1654, had debts of over £4,000, which is £600 today. And this meant that the house was left never been refurbished, it's never been updated, it's never been restored, so it's a perfect time capsule of Tudor domestic architecture. There are 256 burn marks in this house. Dating them is difficult. Uh, the mark on the console bracket post in the great chamber must date after the timber was cut down in 1659. And we've got a couple of marks in the little parlour. The parlour was painted in 1580 and then uh, covered over with panelling in the Georgian period in the 18th century. And you've got a couple of marks here. There's a score mark down here that, as we'll see, is there for a reason because of the doorway and stairs outside. And then on this wall over here, we've got a burn mark and another score mark. So if they're so ubiquitous, what's their purpose? Why are they here? Why do we have 256 of these 
in a single pot. One suggestion is that these are a protection against fire. This is Tritara Court again, and we've got a number of burn marks in the kitchen, which is exactly where you would expect if you think about the hazards of an open fire. Unfortunately, the marks at Tritara Castle, Tritara Court, were not entirely successful. Um, the house was haunted by the White Lady, Margaret Vaughan, who's the widow of Sir Roger Vaughan. Now, Sir Roger was sent in May of 1471 by King Edward IV to capture Jasper Tudor. And was unfortunately found wrong. Sir Roger was captured instead, taken to Chepstow Castle and decapitated. So every night, Lady Margaret gazes out the window castle looking out for her husband to return. So it didn't entirely work in this case. You can also see burn marks in the birthplace of William Shakespeare in the kitchen there in Stratford-upon-Avon. Now William's father John Shakespeare owned the house and the plot of land here since 1552 and then in 1601 when he died it became an inn. Problem is, fire, definitely fire, is a present thing. Um, in 1583, in Nantwich, which is about 16 miles from Livermore Court, a devastating fire broke out that raged for 20 days. Half the town lost its homes and had their houses. And at Livermore Court, they used lime ash flooring as an attempt to try and prevent the outbreak of fire. So I'm not going to deny that fire isn't a problem. But of the 13 fireplaces at Livermore Hall, only three of them have burn marks. This is the upstairs bedroom. This is the upstairs bedroom. You can see the lintel here. There are no burn marks. In fact, the burn marks are here. They're serving a very different function. Their function is to protect the liminal zones of the plot, spaces through which unquiet spirits, evil spirits, witches, devils, and so on may enter the house. They're clustered around doors, windows, chimneys, stairwells. The wall of the great parlour, and it backs onto what's used as the activity room now, this wall here has eight burn marks at ground level and 13 burn marks at first floor level. The reason for that is this used to be an exterior wall. Between 1504 and 1508, this was the outside of the provost house. That provided an avenue into the house. And it continued to act as an avenue into the house after this because of its origins as an exterior access way to the house. And if you go into the activity room, this is a stairwell behind that wall. And you can see here we have more of our protective burn marks. This use of burn marks as a way to protect against entry through doorways, windows and so on may explain other houses as well. This is Lower Brockhampton Court. The gateway here was built in 1543 for the Habington family and it's full. This is Plasma, it's the house of the merchant Robert Wynne in Conwy in North Wales, and it was built between 1576 and 1585. And again, clustered around his doorways, burn marks. 
Now, it's fairly commonplace that witches, evil spirits, enter houses through doors, windows, and fireplaces. <coughs> this is uh, Peter Bruegel the Elders, uh, St. James and the Magician Hermogenes from 1685, and you can see witches entering the house through the fireplace there. Similarly, this anonymous woodcut, 16th century woodcut, the witches are gathered around the house as it burns down, but again, two of them are entering the house through the chimney. And this danger survives in the Yule log that we place in our fireplace through the Christmas period. This is Robert Henrik's Hesperides, written in 1648. Kindle the Christmas brand of Yule log, and then till sunset let it burn, which quenched then lay it upon again till Christmas next return. Part must be kept wherewith to tend the Christmas log next year, and where it is safely kept, the fiend can do no mischief. The whole point of this is to seal that fireplace through to access by witches and evil spirits. On Twelfth Night, you process through the house with candles to ward off evil spirits, and you draw crosses on the ceiling of your house using the flame of your candles. They're also associated with evil spirit storms and so on, particularly thunder. In 1577, um, Alexander Fleming recounted the story of a demonic black dog that attacked a church in Bungay. It, in the middle of a thunderstorm, broke through the door. You could see the claw marks that they attributed to this devilish beast, and then ran rampage down the church, killing a boy and a man, and then running on to Blythborough Church, where it killed more victims. But these are not the only protective symptoms that we have. As well as burn marks, we have, uh, there are 256 burn marks in Little Mortar Hall. We've also got scratched engravings, circles, multifoils, spider webs, concentric circles, arcs, even triangles. This one was discovered in 2005. We're in the great parlour opposite the heart. Now these work in exactly the same way as we've seen with other burn marks. This is the bay window. This is Deer's bay window that's added in 1559 into the 1504 wall. And we've got two sets of concentric circles here and here. Again, it's a liminal zone because it's changed functions. It's providing access to the outside. Behind me is a stairwell going up to the floor above and an exterior door of the house, we've got concentric circles, 12 of them. We've also got them in the exhibition room, we've got them upstairs as well. The largest is in the Great Hall, and it's 200 millimetres in diameter. So they're quite elaborate pieces. And they work, in essence, as spider webs. The evil spirit <coughs> follows the line going into the circle until it is trapped in the middle like a fishing rod. Hmm. Uh, these multiform symbols, um, they date back to Roman times actually, so they may be uh, sun god, uh, Solomon Victor's. 
there are a number in other houses. Uh, sadly, uh, Cadu have put up this tapestry behind the great table in Tritara. It's a great hall, um, uh, but there are hexapoil symbols behind that. And there's also a number at Head Haddon House, for example. There's also triangles. Now these are positioned, there are, there are 70 of them at uh, Lower Moor. Uh, they are positioned in exactly the same way as the other ones we've been looking at, and they probably serve the same purpose. So the evil spirit gets lost in the maze of lines and Now, the, many of these blur the line between religion and magic. The use of candles at candle mass and the feast of the purification of the Virgin. You'd go around the candle, you'd go around the house to protect your home. So wherever it should be lit or set, devil may flee in fear and tremble with all his ministers out of these dwellings and never to presume again to disquiet his servants. And in fact, a row broke out in Freesthorpe uh, in Lincolnshire in the 14th century because the priest had taken down the candles the day after candle mass and the congregation was outright, outraged that they'd lost their protection. And there's a wonderful story in a Tudor jest book the Hunter of Merry Tales that was written and published in 1524-1525. It recounts a John Adorning of Suffolk who terrified his neighbours by wandering around dressed in demon's outfit and continues to do this until they ward him off with a candle and holy water. Holy candles could also be used to illness, funerals, birth, and even as protection against thunderstorms. As well as the use of candles, other symbols provoke Christianity as well. There's a VM symbol, which of course is the Virgin Mary. There's only one exactly why the Tritara Church serves the same purpose. Peace signs refer to the protection of the land by Jesus. And it was particularly important for the festival is Halloween, October 31st. Um, All Saints on November 1st are all souls the following evening uh, when it is particularly important that you ward off evil spirits and deprive them of access to the house. So you go around ringing bells and hearing chimes and go round about the house they go with the torch or taper clear that neither bread nor meat do want nor which with dreadful Why would people turn to magic rather than have recourse to the protection of the church? The abilities of the church to offer moral guidance had been weakened by the abolition of confession and reformation. Some Protestants looked back on the Middle Ages as a time when the church <coughs> had been able to enforce moral standards. John Aubrey wrote, then were the consciences of the people kept in so great awe by confession that just dealing and virtue was habitual. And it's been suggested that the decline in confession may explain an increase in illegitimate births and premature pregnancy after the Reformation. Mm. Now in the Middle Ages, the church had an arsenal Holy water, holy candles, the sign of the cross, exorcisms, and so on. According to the Malaeus Maleficarum, the exorcisms of the church are for this very purpose and are entirely efficacious remedies for preserving oneself from the injuries of witches. But these were renounced by the Protestant Church. In 
1543, the preacher John Scorry asked, how could the devil be afraid of such toys when the New Testament told us he was not even afraid of Christ himself? In their place, the Protestants offered their message and fact, and the belief that true faith could protect you from the devil. Whilst intellectually satisfying, these do not offer the reassurance offered by Catholic rituals, especially when the Protestant clergy are quite open in stating that prayer is not always successful. No surprise then that people turned back to the tried and tested Catholic formula despite the opposition of the church. In 1590, John Dee anointed a possessed maidservant with holy oil. And in 1664, a Newcastle midwife, Miss Pepper, cured a possessed woman using a silver crucifix and holy water. In 1641, the Laudians were accused of teaching that the sign of the cross could ward off demons. The inadequacy Protestant response is evidenced by the case of Agnes. She was the wife of Richard Harrison, who was the priest for Beaumont. And in 1583, Agnes believed she had been possessed by one Agnes Heard. And her husband advised her to put her trust in God and to have recourse to prayer. But if that failed, he would hang said Agnes Heard. If a priest was uncertain about the efficacy of prayer, what can we expect from the laity? When we think of the religious conflicts of the 16th and 17th century, we tend to assume that everyone was engaged in doctrinal controversies, when in fact the opposite may have been the case. With religious absenteeism, being commonplace amongst the poor and the young. One of the many sins of the poor was their failure to attend church. And in the early 17th century, an Oxford minister explained low attendance at this church because they were all poor laboring people and I cannot expect them without rich charity. This is Langley Church in Crockett a particular favourite of mine because it is exactly as it was in the early 17th century. It's not been changed at all. And the reason was so few people went to church, the congregation was so small so quickly that it was abandoned as a church. And that leaves us with this wonderful church in Hamburg. Even even if people attended, their behaviour was less than appropriate. In 1540 to 1542, less than half the congregation of the parish of St. Giles in Colchester turned up to church on Sundays or holidays. And in 1635, William Scott's pamphlet, An Essay on the Drapery of a Complete Citizen, said that there were sometimes more pillars in church than people. If they are there, their behaviour was deplorable. Fighting for seats, talking, hawking, spitting, knitting, making coarse remarks, telling jokes, falling asleep, and even firing guns. Stephen Gardner says that at a parish in Cambridge in 1547, when the vicar goeth to the pulpit to read that he himself hath written, then the multitude of the parish go straight out of the church home to drink. <laughs> Members of the congregation would heckle. So, for example, Holland Magna in Essex in 1630, the rector was preaching about Adam and Eve taking clo making clothes out of fig leaves, at which point one parishioner asks, where did they get their bread? <laughs> in 1598, a Cambridgeshire man was condemned for his most 
loathsome, farting, striking, and coughing speeches. Scoffing speeches. <laughs> now this ignorance was not confined to the poor or the ignorant. <coughs> in 1551, the new bishop of Gloucester found that of his 311 clergy, 171 didn't know the Ten Commandments, 27 did not know the four things of the Lord's Prayer, and 10 could not repeat them. In 1606, Nicholas Band said that there were more, the people knew more about Robin Hood than the scriptures could contain. And the chaos of the 17th century did not help. Ecclesiastical vacancies caused even the most basic Many poor people weren't even baptized. And when the Bishop of Peterborough visited Rutland in 1722, he found that there had been no confirmation meeting for 40 years. The rise of humanism led to increasing skepticism, with prominent figures like Christopher Marlowe and Walter Raleigh rejecting Christ's divinity or even the existence of heaven. It's a lot harder to trace atheism amongst the lower classes, but the rise of Protestant groups like the Ranters, now the Ranters denied the immortality of the soul, resurrection, the authority of the scriptures, the existence of heaven and hell, together with the relative freedom of the Commonwealth, allowed the spread of religious skepticism. In 1648, the blasphemy ordinance imposed punishments for those who denied immortality, doubted the scriptures, rejected Christ, the Holy Ghost, and even the existence of the Almighty God. Which, in my book, leaves very little of religion. In 1608, a butcher in Eli would set his dog on people going to church, and a London actor said that you'd learn more from one of his plays than at 20 sermons. The line between religion and magic is a thick one. People would sprinkle holy water on their homes to stop it to such an extent that in 1557, for example, Cardinal Pole insisted that the font be locked up to prevent people breaking it and stealing the holy water from it. And in 1543, a storm broke out over Canterbury and the inhabitants ran to the church to get holy water to protect their homes from evil spirits and lightning. And in 1591, an Oxford recusant, John Allen, is said to have possessed a quantity of Christ's blood, which he sold at £20 a drop because of its protective powers. The apogee of Burma is the 16th and 17th century, a period of profound religious and political turmoil, when the Reformation, the English Civil War, execution of King Charles I undermined the central tenets of daily life. At the same time, the interregnum, the proliferation of Protestant groups, removes moral certainties and opens up alternative solutions. It was a time of plague. There were outbreaks of plague at Congleton in the Little Morton Hall in 1559, 1630, when 40 people die in Asbury, and in 1641, in the latter case, lasting two years. And you can get an idea of the range of dangers from this bill of mortality that lists the causes of deaths in London between six, the 16th and the 22nd of August, 1661. Now this is right at the heart of the Great Plague. And it's not surprising, then, that the bubonic plague was the main cause of death, with 3,880 victims. But other diseases take their toll, including spotted fever, which is typhus, consumption, which is tuberculosis, convulsions, griping of the guts, diarrhea, uh, rickets, worms, 
rising of the light, as well as minor ailments like thrush and the wind. Two people are frightened to death, and over a hundred people died of their teeth. Right? But disease was seen as supernatural in origin. The Puritan Henry Holland attributed the plague to evil spirits. And stormy weather was proof. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're not having a technological we savvy didn't, day. We, you know, didn't, we didn't put the burn marks on the pillars. Before I know, we didn't close the probe. Did we? Yeah. This is all my fault because I forgot my... Uh, uh, cord linking my memory stick. <coughs> this is a terrifying world. There are many different ailments that will afflict you. Not only will they kill you, they will also scar you. They are visible. I wonder how many people walking the streets of London in 1665 would have met crippled people. We trip, we break our leg, we go to the hospital, six weeks later, none the wiser. In 1665, that is with you for life. You are hobbling down the streets thereafter. Clergy no longer are no longer the go-to solution. In fact, they're not even, perhaps, the best. Instead, we turn to wise men, wise women, conjurers, <coughs> magicians, sorcerers, witches, practitioners of folk music. Not folk music. <laughs> what, a, what a terrible fate that would be. <laughs> practitioners of folk music. You could play, play some <laughs> it's it's my drunken debauchery last night. <laughs> Practitioners of folk magic. It's all that sweet tea I've got to me. I'm not usually up at eleven o'clock at night. Now the church tries to combat this through ecclesiastical courts, and witchcraft is banned in 1542, 1562 and 1604, and the latter legislation stays in force until 1736. But the need to repeat the legislation shows how ineffective it was. In 1552, Bishop Latimer said, a great many of us, when we be in trouble or sickness or lose anything, we run hither and thither to witches Sorcerers whom we call wise men, seeking aid and comfort in their hands. Now it's difficult to quantify how many witches there actually were, and how many practitioners of folk magic. In the Home Assize Court, between 1559 and 1736, 512 people were accused of witchcraft, just over 200 of them were found guilty, and 109 of them were executed. Now the Home Assize Court is one of five size circuits through the country, so if you factor it up for a country as a whole, we may be looking at as many as a thousand people must be killed during this period. But the number of trials is only a small percentage of the number of accusations. There are more than 120 cases in the Buckinghamshire Doctor's Richard Napier's case book between 1600 and 1630, and 50 in William Lilly's from 1644 to 1666, and none of these seem to apply to Ireland. Unlike continental Europe, the driving force seems not to have been the existence of the compact the witch and the devil, but the damage that witches did to their neighbours, the damage that they do to their wives. In 1580, 
1887, Essex minister George Gifford stressed that the witches were hated for their actions, not for their association. Of the 492 uh, indictments before the Essex Society, only 28 were actually put in very keen malevolent spirits. And 18 of these were under the influence of the notorious witch finder General Michael Hopkins, who is an aberration. To return to where we began, Robert Tooley instructed his patient to drive a stake through the corpse's heart. This is actually uh, tend to dismiss all of this as far distant aberration. Uh, this actually remained the law for suicides up until 1823. Because they could become vampires in some, some superstition. Yep. Um, Warren Percy, the bodies are mutilated uh, because of fear that they will come back to life as vampires. And in the news yesterday, I didn't follow it up, but I, I should. Uh, they've excavated a hole into a cemetery where the bodies have layers over their throats so that when they return to life as vampires, they're decapitated and they can then rise up from the ground. So it's an ever present fear. To drive a stake through his heart to prevent him coming back as a ghost because of fear that they will return and turn them out. Although burn marks have only recently been discovered, historians and archaeologists are now finding them all over the country in medieval and Tudor houses. And they're a physical expression of the fear that people felt at the presence of evil in the underworld. The inadequacy of the church and the existing mechanisms to protect them, and the fear that they must have felt forcing them to take Christmas Day in the woods. It's fascinating, but it's quite terrifying that it was such an uncertain and evil world that these people had come from, and the lengths that they would go to to try and save themselves that they might come back. So I thought I would finish by admonishing you all with the words from Versions of Door Abbey. Anyway, apologies about my technological inadequacies, but I hope I've given you food for thought about the failings of the Protestant Church. Does anybody have any questions? I, I got just a little side comment. Uh, I, I mentioned this briefly. Uh, Eamon Duffy in his Stripping of the Altars, which is a great book, he says, by the time of the English Reformation, that the English Roman Catholic Church was a lot ro more robust, generally speaking, than historians previously gave it uh, gave it credit for. And you you hinted on that that not everybody was on board with Henry VIII. Oh no, absolutely not. Um, my own take is that for the major, this is why the images are so important in churches like Kempton. Most of the congregation don't know the Bible. They don't know the doctrinal niceties of it. They get their information through the images they see in the church. The carvings, the stained glass windows, exactly. the liturgy. Um, one of my favorites are the Herefordshire Romanesque uh, carvings, where you decorate the church on the inside with the saints, on the outside with all the fearsome beasties that the church is protecting you from. They don't have the time or the wherewithal to worry about the niceties of doctrine between Canterbury and Rome. What they want to see is an effective priest doing something dramatic to frighten off demons. Incense, candles, music, robes, I'm the same. I like the Catholic Church because I get value for money. It's entertaining. <laughs>
prayer, particularly if your priest is saying, this might not work, <laughs> isn't really going to satisfy me in a war between Satan. And at the same time, as we're throwing out all of the Catholic Church's weapons in the war against the devil, they're, they're dismissed as trickery, that the, the Catholic clergy are faking demonic possession, they're faking yeah. ghosts. The well, same then. Puritans are saying we are at risk because the devil is now an even greater threat. There'd been lots of ghost stories in the Middle Ages, but they all end happily because the church is there to keep us safe. And they continue to worry about ghosts after the Reformation. The Thomas Broomhall's first, it writes the first compendium of ghost stories in 1658. It says, Treasury of Spectres. They're all into this. Bishop Pilkington says, he's, he, at the beginning of the reign of Elizabeth I, he's talking about ghosts in Blackburn. And he says that even the authorities won't have gainsay to mention this. But we all believe in ghosts. So these are a threat. They're still here. The Puritans, the Protestants are telling us this is a grave threat. But there's nothing we can do about it. So, so where do you go? The burn you go back. tolerated just... Yeah, we go back to what the Catholic Church did. So the Anglican Church basically says, well, we know we can't stamp out this practice, so we'll just sort of try to live with it. Even if your people are going to keep making the burn marks, despite what we can do. Yeah. Um, that's why gradually... Week. They come up with new methods to deal with it. They quietly bring back a lot of elements of Catholicism. This is one of the problems with William Lord and the Lordians. He's the Archbishop of Canterbury between 1633 and 1640. They're bringing back elements of Catholicism because people need the reassurance. But they were doing burn marks, you said, into the 19th century. Yeah. That blows my mind. Yeah. I probably shouldn't, but it does. Well, it, it, it's crazy. I mean, by then, they're aberrations. Yeah. They really, it really is the 16th and 17th century that's the absolute pinnacle. Humanism doesn't help. Um, of course, the Catholics say that the, the ghosts are unquiet spirits in purgatory, and the Protestants then deny the existence of purgatory. So, where are ghosts coming from? Well, they're demons. That doesn't reassure me. I'd rather it was grandma coming back, <laughs> not <laughs> Satan in the guise of a big black dog or something. And that's why Agnes, the, the lady who's possessed by Agnes Heard, is so interesting. That even her husband, who's a clergyman, says, put your face in God. If that doesn't work, pray. And if that doesn't work, I'll go and kill Agnes. And if a clergyman is saying, we need to go kill the witches because we have no other answer to them. And by doing away with confession, the church, then the, the clergy are no longer there. It's like Thomas Cartwright's advising you to talk to your minister, the Presbyterian Thomas Cartwright, to talk to your minister and to seek guidance. But this is all unofficial. Because the church is saying confession is Catholic, we don't do it here. So who do you turn to? You can't turn to your clergyman, you can't turn to the church as a whole. So who do you turn to? Wise men, witches. You take it into your own hands. And yet people like Robert Tooley are tricksters. That's why he's up for the court in Truro. But he's satisfying a need. And that's how he can get away with charging you 20 shillings. Which is an astronomical sum because 
a skilled laborer will only earn 30 pence a week. George. I have two things, probably vastly unrelated. But the first is, what are the Calvinists or Puritans divine saying about things like burn marks and rings and so forth? Are they preaching sermons against this? No. They're just leaving it alone. They're leaving it alone. Okay. You mean the Jorma markers don't? Yeah. So the other one, the other question is, are any of the ring motifs associated with a hollowing? No. Okay. Because that's one of the that's one of the problems um, with the burn marks being accidental or not. They are a deliberate depth and shape. Now you can create them with cameras. You can create them with pokers, but it takes hours. The 2014 vernacular architecture, they and they ended up stopping one of the tests because it was just going on for hours, and it didn't create the burn mark. So they're they're very deliberate. Um, it's also very different between the continent and England. In the continent, the initiative seems to be coming from clergy. There are church organisations that are opposed to this. In England, it's not the church. The fear of witches is coming, it's from them damaging your property. <coughs> it's the neighbours in your community who are frightened what she will do, or the sorcerer, what he will do, to your property. So it's coming from ordinary people. There's no doctrinal justification. The church isn't really... Part of it. Does that answer? So the so where I was heading with it was, as you likely have, I've seen many many cup and ring mark stones. Yeah. And it strikes me that this is a carrying over of that sensibility that somehow if we make these concentric marks, which we don't understand on these outcroppings throughout Britain. But they must be holy since they've been there time out of mind. We'll just transfer them to our exactly. dwelling. Are you suggesting that history hasn't changed? <laughs> Goodness, Human George. nature being what it is. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And of course, the if, if you're not engaged in the doctrinal controversies of Henry VIII and his desire to, to have children with Anne Berlin, even if it costs a break with Rome and the church. You don't understand the new fangled prayer and fasting and so on. You like the things that have been hallowed by thousands of years of tradition that have worked for millennia. Like the, the petals, the, the sun god. Like the Green Man, Sheena no Gig, um, all things going back thousands. Of, you don't understand it, but it must work if it's that thousand years old, must it? I'd rather trust that than some new idea that doesn't seem to be very good. What were some of the ways that the witches were doing property damage? Harming children, um, infant mortality is devastating, and mothers dying in childbirth as well, devastating. Um, they're blamed for outbreaks of disease. They're blamed for bad weather. The winters of 16, 15, 14, and 16, 34, 35 are particularly bad up around Little Morton Hall, and they get blamed for that. Cows not giving milk and all sorts of mundane yeah. things. You name it. Any, none of us have ever taken accountability for our actions over thousands of years. My cheese didn't go off because I left it out in the sun for three weeks. It was a witch. <laughs> my house burnt down because I didn't put the fire out last night. Not my fault. I wasn't too drunk. It was a witch. 
everything that you don't want to take responsibility for, somebody else's problem. And this is equally disturbing if you're thinking about the fact that these, the, the persecution of witches is not being carried out through the church system, the ecclesiastical courts. It's being carried out through the lay community. How much hatred there must have been for these people just because they were different. Well, it goes for almost getting made those accusations to Salem. They let her admit it. Oh, we were just making it up. Yep. We had issues with these other girls. So, And then the, the really, oh, well, we've already executed them now. Now what do we do? Thanks for telling us now. Remind the, the paintings in the lower part of the, the little parlour in Little Morton Hall are from the Apocrypha. It's the story of Susanna, who's the wife of a Babylonian, a wealthy Babylonian called Joachim. And uh, a couple of judges come to his house and they see her in the garden and they try to convince her to let her, let them have their way with her. And when she refuses, she, they accuse her of adultery. And she is about to be stoned, to be stoned to death, when a man by the name of Dan, a young man by the name of Dan, comes and explains what's happened. And then the judges are killed in the process. Okay. If you go to Lempster Priory, there's a docking stool <coughs> still in the church there. And it was used for any disobedient woman. She had no recourse, no say, nothing. It was just uh, a male accuser of this, and she's done. And now it's not for killing; it's not like the, the witchcraft punishment, which is you throw them into the river, and if they sink, oh dear, they were innocent, and if they float, then God will execute her because she's evil. Um, but it's people still drowned, and it was used up until. The 18th, 19th, late 19th century was the last time that the ducking stool in Lempster was used. And in fact, uh, the death penalty, the, the legislation in 1604 imposes the death penalty for witches on their second case. And the last execution was Anne Mullard, Anne Mullard in 1685. Last trial was Leicester in 1717. But the legislation stayed on the books. The last person condemned for witchcraft was 1944, Helen Duncan, a medium. And she was holding uh, seances in England and was communicating and so she'd get people like from HMS Hood come and fill it up. Your little boy has died on HMS Hood. He was in the Baltic at the time. This is where the, the battleship sunk. And of course, this is military information, so the Germans come along and would send spies to uh, her seances and everything. Oh, look, HMS Hood sank in the Baltic. Right, okay, well, let's, HMS Hood is part of this battle group. So that means that these other warships are down there in the Baltic as well. Right, now we know where the sixth fleet is. Um, and the government realized they needed to silence Helen Duncan. And the only thing they could find that they were still on the books together was the 1735 witchcraft legislation. And so they imprisoned her for the rest of the voyage. That was the last. Well, thank you, Dr. Lowe. That, that was very cool. I, I asked him if there had been any books written on this topic, and he said it's so recent that they figured out what these burn marks are, that there, haven't, there hasn't been time to write any really authoritative books yet, but there are some journal articles. But this was very, very intriguing to me, and this, this was very cool stuff. So, Give him a round of applause. Thanks for coming today. Just remember the Alabama Renaissance Fair.
uh, goes on uh, the 28th and 29th at Fountain on the Green, a.k.a. Wilson Park. We will coronate a new monarch, so come and make merry with us. If you are interested in following this up, I will happily, there's not much published, and this is not my research, but even in, in my own interest in magic like this, several of these are unpublished, so several of the Fern Marks that I talk about here have never actually been catalogued or published, so there's not much out there. But what there is, I'll happily share. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.